Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rory Fraser McKenzie. I'm ETC's market manager for Europe. Um, I will be co hosting this session with Declan. Uh, my job is basically to be typing furiously throughout this session. Um, so if you have any questions that, that are burning that you would like to ask, just stick them into the Q&A window um, and I will do my best to either answer them or put them to one side to ask Declan at a convenient break. Um, otherwise, we'll be starting in a, a minute or two. Uh, for those of you asking, uh, you can probably guess from the accent that I am based out of the ETC's London office, um, as is Declan, um, but we have attendees calling in from around the world. Um, the last session saw people from uh, from both East Asia, all the way across to the US, um, as north as Scandinavia and as south as South Africa. Um, so this is, is quite a well-attended global webinar. Uh, and thank you all for calling in. We'll be starting very shortly. No pressure then. Thanks, Rory. Great. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for part two of Making the Light Fantastic. Uh, which is our four-part series, uh, which introduces the basic principles of lighting design. Uh, I'm Declan Randall, and uh, I work for ETC as their training program coordinator in the UK and Europe uh, regions. Uh, before that, I was a freelance lighting set and projection designer. Um, so thank you for making the journey from the kitchen to the living room to join us today. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, with today's session. Um, in part one, we looked at some overall concepts. We chatted about the objectives of light and design of controllable properties of light. And one of the controllable properties of light is distribution. And that basically comes down to which lights you choose, where you put them, and how you focus them. And that's what we're going to be spending uh, today's session on. So uh, without any further ado, we're going to jump right in and we're going to have a look at uh, the types of lights that uh, are available. Um, this list, of course, is not exhaustive. Uh, we've broken down to the lights that you're most likely to come across most often. Um, and obviously, there are slight variations on a theme, but we'll, we'll get to those as we go. So I like to think that there are six basic categories of lights that you're likely to come across. Um, well, there are five categories. Number six, you'll see, is a sort of subcategory, but uh, we'll get there. So the first, and I'm ranging them from simplest, and we'll get towards the more complex as we go. The simplest of all lights are floodlights. Uh, we then step it up a notch, and we get beam lights. We have PARs, focus spots, and profiles. Uh, we call them profiles in the UK. Uh, in America, they're referred to as ellipsoidals, um, but it's, it's the same kind of thing. The terms are interchangeable. And this last category, I've added moving lights in here, and it's not really a category, and you'll see, because moving lights sort of can either be or beam lights or PARs or focus spots or profiles. So they kind of sort of slot in everywhere, but I've added them into category because they feature so heavily in everything that we do. Today. So starting with the simplest kind of lights, uh, let's break this down and have a look at floodlights. So, there's some couple of images of floodlights, and they are the simplest of all lighting instruments. There's not a lot involved. They really they just consist of a lamp and a reflector, uh, obviously within a housing, and um, they are really designed to just light a large area with a really short throw distance. They sort of flood the stage with light if you uh, want to take that a little bit further. Uh, most of the floodlights we use in theatre tend to be used for sort of cyclorama lighting or backlight lighting. But if you think back to uh, part one, where we spoke about the history of lighting, and you looked at where electric lighting was introduced into theatres, it started as sort of overhead battens, which were basically floodlights. And they were just making sure that there was light on stage. And obviously, as technologies developed, applications changed. And they tend to be now uh, allocated mainly to cyclorama or backlight lighting. Most of the units that you will find in these positions will have what we call an asymmetrical reflector. You get two kinds of floodlights. You have a symmetrical floodlight, where the lamp sits in the middle of the reflector. And then the kind that we will use most often for lighting cycloramas will be an asymmetrical reflector. And so the lamp sits um, out of the center, and the reflector is, is curved in such a way to distribute the light evenly from top to bottom. Floodlights could have been single units, as the image on the left. They can also be sort of 
strapped together into battens. Um, this is most common on cyclorhombo lighting. You sometimes get four in a row. You sometimes get them as sort of four square. Uh, but they'll basically do the same thing. If you have a look at the image on the left, you can see there's a sort of jagged edge along the bottom of that gel frame. There's sort of some teeth running along the bottom edge of that gel frame. And what those teeth do is they diffuse the light on that edge of the beam so that you don't see the hard line of where that light actually ends. So if you were lighting your cyclorama, you'd have a hard edge of light at the top, which is probably masked out by a border or some scenery. And then you put the teeth at the bottom of the gel frame and that blends the light out as it sort of washes down the cycle. And nine times out of 10, you have a row of units on the floor as well lighting up uh, to give you sort of two different colors on the site and make sure that you can light the site evenly from top to bottom. If the fixture is going to flip around, then on the fixtures on the floor and the ground row, the teeth would be at the top end of the gel frame so that the light blends out to the top and a hard edge at the bottom uh, where the cyclorama or cloth meets the floor. Uh, with most of these fixtures, uh, there have been uh, developments recently, and of course we've gone from tungsten and most of our fixtures and theatres these days are all LED. So we of course have a range of LED floodlights. They were probably amongst the first to sort of really become popular uh, in theatres. And here is, uh, we, this is our colour source range, this is the colour source site unit. And with these floodlights, they have specially designed optics to make sure that you get even light distribution across the site. And you'll find that they kind of sort of come in two flavors. You'll either have uh, the individual units like the color source site, or you also get them in sort of battens, linear battens, um, like the color source linear. And of course, other manufacturers have different versions of this. What you'll find if you're using the linear battens is you tend to need additional lensing that sort of goes on the front in order to make sure that the light is distributed evenly across the site. So they tend to have a uh, slightly wider vertical distribution and slightly narrower horizontal distribution to make sure that you can light your site uh, evenly. Another option, of course, with LED for lighting the site is you can use the psych adapter for the source four uh, LED. That uh, replaces the standard lens tube that fits on the front of your source four and that converts it into a unit for lighting cycloramas. And again, you can see a really specially designed optic there. Um, which is designed to make sure that you can distribute the light evenly from the top of the site uh, down to the bottom. So moving on from floodlights, uh, the next light in our category are beam lights. And uh, these are two little tungsten versions. We don't see them too much anymore these days, slowly but surely, as you know, tungsten is starting to fade out. Um, and of course, they're being replaced by their LED equivalents. So beam lights are almost the exact opposite of the floodlight where the floodlight is designed to cover a really wide area at a really short distance, the beam light is designed to give you very intense near parallel beams of light. Um, and obviously for that point, they're mainly used for effects. Uh, the unit on the left is a beam light and that uh, was often used for follow spots. Uh, and the unit on the left is a much smaller version of that. Uh, and that was nine times out of 10, you would find those lighting mirror balls. Of course, every self-respecting show should have a mirror ball. If we have a look at the optics involved there, there's actually two uh, optical systems. There is, if you look in the front of the fixture, there is a parabolic reflector that sits just in front of the lamp, and that makes sure that all the light gets sent back to the secondary parabolic reflector that sits at the back of the fixture, and that casts the light out in that near parallel beam. One of the big disadvantages of beam lights is they are all use a low voltage, high wattage lamp. So your lamp life you tend to sacrifice. Uh, the fixture on the left, for instance, you would get somewhere between 50 and 100 hours, which is not a lot of light, particularly if you're relying on it for use as a follow spot. Uh, next up in our little bag of tricks, uh, we have park hands. And park hands were largely designed for the rock and roll market because they were cheap, they were light, uh, and they were really, really bright and powerful. So PARs, or park hands as the complete unit, produce very bright, intense beams of light. And they all use PAR lamps. And that's kind of where they get their name from. PAR is a uh, abbreviation for parabolic illuminized reflector. And basically what that means is it's a single sealed beam unit where the lamp, the lens, and the reflector are all together in one unit. 
that obviously has some advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. Beams in your PARs are actually slightly oval in shape. They're not uh, perfectly round beams. So that gives you another layer of focus that you can add into the fixture. So not only can you sort of point it where you need to, but you can also rotate the beam and you can place the axis of that oval depending which way you want that to lie. So it gives you an additional uh, level of control over the beam. One of the problems with park hands is that if you needed to change the beam angle, you would actually have to change the whole lamp because the lens, lamp and reflector are all one unit. If you want a, a wide light for this particular production, it would be one kind of lamp. If on the next production you need a much narrower lamp, you have to change the whole lamp. So it became a very expensive system for theaters that have rental companies. You had to keep large stocks of the lamps to be able to make sure that they could use them in any combination that's required. Uh, so this little picture here shows you the sort of oval uh, beam that's coming out. Um, it's, it, it is quite oval, and depending on the uh, type of lamp, uh, the the sense of the oval actually is is more noticeable. Um, here are a couple of typical lamp options that you'll find for the PAR 64, particularly PAR 64. They come in a, in a range. You get 64s, PAR 64s, and PAR 56s, probably the most common, and that refers to the physical size of the lamp. Uh, and just for our people visiting uh, who've joined us um, from outside of the UK and Europe, uh, these lamp designations are the European lamp designations. I'm going to get onto the onto the lamp designations uh, for the other fixtures in a second. And here, ranging from narrowest at the top to widest at the bottom, uh, there's five sort of basic lamps um, that would change your beam angles or your pars. Now, a variation on the PAR can uh, was the Source 4 PAR, and this was introduced uh, quite a few years ago now. And the big advantage of the Source 4 PAR is that the lamp and reflector were separate, and all you were interchanging were the lenses. And when the lens is clipped in, you still have the ability to rotate the lens, so you could still create and replicate the effect of aligning the oval shape of the beam. So this became a much more cost-effective system running park hands. It also meant that if you had other source for units in the rig, they were all using the same lamp, so you, your lamp stock uh, became much more affordable. Uh, the source for power is also now available with the source forward LED engine. Uh, so if your rig, if your venue is making a change towards LED and you have a bunch of these, um, just know that there is now a source forward version of this PAR that you can replace your existing PARs with. Uh, the lenses will still work. The same lenses you have will still work with, uh, with the new source forward engine. And that there's a picture of the uh, source forward LED PAR. Now, these lenses, when we refer to the lens angles on these PARs, this is slightly more in line with the PAR lamps uh, that you get in the States. And we refer to them by a letter designation. The NSP is very narrow spot, narrow spot, medium flood, wide flood, and very wide flood. Um, and those matched the beam angles that the original PAR lamps used to replicate, which is where that uh, reference comes from. And of course, uh, like everything else, PARC hands also made the move into LED world. And uh, there are a number of them out there from a number of different manufacturers. Uh, but these are sort of the most common things you will find. Now, technically speaking, they're not PARs anymore because PAR referred to the kind of lamp. Um, and of course, these have a completely different optical system. So technically, they're not actually PARs, but we've come to refer to them as LED PARs, uh, largely because it helps people understand their application. So on these, your beam angle are adjusted with a set of interchangeable lenses. And one of the great things with LED uh, with lensing is you can do some really clever things. Because there's not a lot of heat in the beam anymore, there are a range of plastic lenses available now. And you can absolutely customize the beam angles of those lenses quite specifically as a manufacturer. And you can convert that into a perfectly round beam. Uh, you can also create the oval shaped beams. Uh, and there are a number of effects beam shaper lenses that are available as well. So do remember if you're ever purchasing LED PARs uh, that it's a good idea to make sure that you check their beam angle and if you need extra lenses, um, 
it is definitely worth uh, getting those at the same time. Now, there's been a couple of change in, changes in the way LED, has, LED fixtures have been manufactured over the years. When they first came out, as you can see on the unit on the left, uh, you actually had separate emitters in all the different colors of the LEDs. And of course, what that would result in is you could result in multicolored shadows happening on the stage, and that could be quite distracting, depending on what you're doing. So LED technology, of course, improved, and we now end up with what we call homogenized LED sources where the red, the green, the blue, and the white chip sometimes is all part of the same chip and focused through the same optic, as you can see in the color source par here on the right. Uh, and what that does is it helps to eliminate the multicolor shadows that you used to get from the LED fixed. Moving on, uh, we have a look at focus spots. They're kind of next in our list. And these are the first lights in our sort of collection that actually gives you some measure of control over the beam. And focus spots, there are two types of focus spots, Fresnels and PCs. And I'll come back to a PC in a second. Fresnels are named for the type of lens that they use. Any light that has a sort of lens with those concentric rings on it, that will be a Fresnel. And the Fresnel lens was uh, developed by a chap called Auguste Fresnel. He was a French uh, engineer, and he designed the lens actually for use in lighthouses. And they obviously adapted, and we've started to use them in stage technology. Now, on a focus spot and in a Fresnel, your lens is in a fixed position, and the lamp and reflector position changes, and that gives you the adjustment on your beam angle. So the further your lamp is uh, from your lens, the narrower the beam. And the closer the lamp and reflector is, the wider the beam angle. So it gives you a really good adjustment. And these are fantastic fixtures uh, for use on stage and overhead where you've got particularly short throws, uh, but you need to get really good wide coverage on stage. Uh, you tend to find Fresnels in overhead uh, stage positions. Uh, Fresnels will all produce a round, really soft edged beam of light. And that's really a useful thing because when you creating your backlight wash using some Fresnels, you really want to be able to blend that wash evenly so you don't see where the light stops and starts from one fixture to the other. And Fresnels are great because of that soft edge beam. Another advantage of using Fresnels is you can do some rough shaping on the beam by adding an accessory on the front uh, called a barn door. So if we have a look here, you can see what I mean by a soft edge beam. Uh, there's quite a sort of hot center and the light sort of just gradually fades out uh, to the end, there's no sort of real definitive end point. Uh, and here's a, an image of a Fresnel, of a bond or attachment, sorry, on the Fresnel, and you can see it gives you some rough shaping, and you maintain that nice soft edge even with your barn doors. So if we just have a look at what's going on in there optically, here you can see your Fresnel lens, and where the source is really close, you can see how the light. Uh, is spread out, and as the source is pulled further away, that lamp narrows right down. Um, and it varies from fixture to fixture, manufacturer to manufacturer, but as an average rule, I would say your beam angle varies between about 12 degrees at its narrowest, and it opens up to about 50, 55 degrees at its widest. Uh, so they're great fixtures to have because you can narrow it right down if you need to highlight something, or you can open them out if you need to create broad color washes. Uh, next in line um, of our focus spots are PCs. Now, I'm aware that PCs are not very popular in America at all, but they are hugely popular in Europe. And PCs, like the Fresnel, are also named because of its lens. It has a plano convex lens, and that's where the PC comes from. Uh, so it's a lens that's flat on one side and curved on the other. Uh, you will also find PCs that are called pebble convex. And what they've done there is they've actually put a slight stippling on the back of the lens just to help diffuse that light a little bit. So PCs have a slightly sharper edge than a Fresnel. So they're slightly more defined and they have a wider beam range. So a PC will typically go down to about six degrees and open up to about 60. Um, so it's, uh, it, it gives you a, a much bigger beam. One thing to watch out for though, if you do come across PCs, is some of them have a horrible tendency to give you quite a dark spot in the middle when you open them out to full flood. 
Um, so we tend to never really let them go as wide as they can. Just keep that a little bit and then make sure you get a nice even uh, beam of light. So here's a, an image of the beam uh, from a PC. You can see it's slightly sharper than it was for the Fresnel. Uh, same as the Fresnel, you can also add the uh, barn doors to give you some shaping and some control. And uh, what I've done in the past is I've actually used a two kilowatt version of a PC spotted right down to its narrowest. And I use that as a follow spot when I'm doing some really short throw follow spotting. Uh, if we can't afford beam lights or there aren't any beam lights available, that makes uh, a pretty good substitute. So the last of the category of light we're going to come across are profiles or ellipsoidals. And they're kind of the all singing, all dancing fixture. They can pretty much do everything. So profiles, firstly, are capable of projecting a very hard-edged beam of light. They're capable uh, of giving you a very, very defined edge uh, around your beam. Uh, and because of that, you have a lot of control over the beam, which is why you tend to find them rigged in positions where you need the most control over the light. So obviously, they're most popular in the front of house positions uh, because you want to have absolute control over that light beam uh, when it's coming down onto stage. And where a profile or an ellipsoidal is different from a focus spot, in your focus spot, your lens is fixed and your lamp and reflector travel. In a profile, your lamp and reflector are fixed and it is your lens that is moving to adjust, uh, to adjust the beam quality. You also have a set of four shutters built into the fixture that offer you some really precise uh, beam shape control. So these sit internally to the fixture as opposed to the barn door, which clips on uh, to the front of the fixture. And I think my favorite thing in the world ever is the ability to project gobos. I love gobos, and we're gonna have a look at those in a second. Uh, but profiles are the only lights that can actually project a pattern with a nice sharp crisp edge. Um, and if I think I was ever told that I wasn't allowed to use gobos, it would be a very sad production period for me. Uh, in addition to that, there's additional beam adjustments that you can use uh, by using an iris. So here you can see we've got a very, very defined edge to that beam. You can absolutely see where the beam starts and where the beam stops. You are able to knock that edge off the beam. So by focusing by a slight adjustment in the lenses, you can soften the edge of that beam. So your profiles are capable of being hard edge spots, or they can soften up um, to form part of a wash. Uh, so you don't get hard lines on your actors' faces as they're moving across the stage. There are a couple of ways that you can soften the beam. You can do it using the lenses, or you can use a piece of filter called a frost or a diffusion filter which will also soften the edge of that beam. Uh, and there's a little graphic uh, of the little iris that drops into the middle of the fixture where you have the shutters that sits just in front of the shutter. That part of the fixture is called the gate. Uh, and you, at the gate, you can add your iris and you can also add your gobos. So here are a couple of images. Uh, so having a look at gobos, you can see a gobo in a sharp focus and a gobo in a slightly softer or focus. That, that has been done using the lens. That's an optical focus on that. Uh, and there's just a couple of images there of gobos. There are probably thousands of different uh, patterns available from all the different manufacturers. They've all got their catalogs and they all do slightly different things. Um, I love using gobos as a storytelling uh, tool. I find them incredibly useful. Uh, if you think back to part one, uh, one of our objectives of light and design is information. And it's a great way to be able to convey information is simple use of a gobo. If I use a little window gobo and cast a window into the set, straight away I'm telling the audience this is an interior scene. And then by changing the color, it can be a daytime, a nighttime, a sunset, a sunrise. So straight away, you're just sort of building up uh, on all your sort of narrative tools. Profiles or ellipsoidals uh, are available also in two flavors, and um, we call those either fixed beam optics or zoom optics. And of course, profiles, uh, like everything else, also have an LED equivalent. Um, and that basically means you can now mix your colors directly from within the fixture. You are not uh, no longer relying on fixed color filters anymore. We will be spending a little bit more time on color. 
uh, in uh, part three of our series. So with your fixed beam angles, uh, the most common beam angles that you're likely to find are going to be 19 degrees, 26 degrees, 36 degrees, and 50 degrees. And in the zoom profiles, you get a variation of a 15 to 30 and a 25 to 50. So you get a sort of narrow zoom and a wide zoom optic. And those pretty much cover everything. There are other angles available, uh, and those are your 5, 10, 40, 70, and 90 degree lenses. And a 70 and a 90 degree lens tube, when you're doing sort of gobo work, are fantastic. There's one fixture sitting quite low in your grid. If you don't have a lot of grid height, pop that wide lens in, and you can get a lovely sort of effect of sunlight streaming through the trees, what appears to be from a single source, uh, which is really, really useful. Those wide angle profiles are fantastic. So if we just have a look quickly at what's happening optically inside that fixture, they're called ellipsoidals because of the nature of their reflector. They have an ellipsoidal reflector inside them, and what that does is it focuses all the light through a point, through a central point, and that's called the gate, and that's where you'll find the shutters, your iris slot, your gobo slot, and then from there it crosses over and out through the lenses and out through the front of the fixture. And if you have a look at this picture, you can actually see the beams of light are crossing over as they come out. And that's why when you're putting your gobos in, you have to put your gobos in upside down and back to front because that light is actually changing optically uh, as it passes through the optical system of the fixture. So then we get on to moving lights. And the reason they're not a separate category is because they're kind of made up. They, you're, you, they are intelligent versions of the other five kinds of lights that are available. So I would say that you have four main categories of moving lights. Uh, we have wash lights, which basically replace your PARs and your Fresnels and your PCs. Uh, we have spots, which will replace your profiles because spots are capable of generating gobos, framing shutters, any sort of hard-edged animation effects. Uh, you have effect lights, um, which are really just there. I have something called eye candy, which has become really popular over the past few years, thanks to the X factors and things of the world, where you just want something pretty to look at in the background. Uh, and then something else that's become quite popular these days is a hybrid fixture. And that's something that will become a beam light uh, or a wash light or a spot. And basically the categories uh, vary according to the capability of the fixtures. Um, Rory, have we got any uh, questions that we should um, tackle at this point? No, I've been fielding them very well today, if I may say so myself. Excellent. Um, I, there was one I see that caught out the corner of my eye about a Parnell. Um, and I should probably just touch on that. I didn't cover on that. ETC have released a fixture, or did release a fixture called the Parnell a few years ago, which was a lovely fusion somewhere between a Fresnel and a Par. And um, it didn't quite have the full range of uh, zoom that a normal Fresnel had. It went from about 23 degrees to about 45 degrees, my memory serves. Um, and actually, the Parnell is also now available uh, with the source forward LED engine. So, those are our main sort of categories of lights and a, a sort of rough introduction as to what they can do. So the next part of distribution comes down to where we decide to put the lights and how we want to focus them. So next we're gonna have a look at, are gonna be what we call the lighting angles. And I would say that given all the positions that exist in all the theaters and all the places where we can possibly put fixtures, there are probably six basic lighting angles that everything is based around. And if you think back to part one, one of our primary objectives of lighting design is visibility. So I've listed the angles out in the order from best visibility to poorest visibility. And of course, in this application, by visibility, I mean the ability to see our actors' faces. Um, obviously, turning any light on on stage will allow you to see, but when we talk of visibility, I'm thinking more about um, our actors' faces. And also, um, just so you know, when I talk about actors, I use that word synonymously with any performer or any person that we happen to be lighting, whether it's a dance piece, an opera, a musical, 
um, whether you work in houses of worship and you have a choir and the pastor on stage, the same principles apply. But I'm just going to use the word actor to sort of roll them all up uh, into one. And I'll also probably use the word production or theatre or play to sort of encompass uh, any form of uh, live event. So our lighting angles. Uh, we would start with our flat front light. Uh, we get a 45 degree front light. Top light, a back light, a side light, and an up light. And I would say that those are your basic angles. Everything else is probably a variation on that theme. So again, we'll start by looking at the one that gives us the most visibility. And that's going to be our flat front light. So that's a light that's rigged directly in front of the performer, as close to perpendicular to the performer as you can get. And it just sort of blasts on in there. And as you can see, um, it absolutely offers us good visibility. We can definitely see the actors' faces. There's, there's no question there. Uh, and I'll tell you where this light is, is useful. It can be very handy sometimes to remove shadows caused by hats. Um, you may come across a production where you're doing a period piece or somebody's wearing a, a hat with a big peak and you find it's really tricky to get light on the actor's face. This angle can really help just sort of get in underneath that uh, hat and sort of remove some of the shadows that that might cause. Uh, it's an ideal position for doing any projection work because there's minimal keystoning. Uh, keystone is that distortion of your image you get if you don't project something from a sort of true perpendicular angle. A flat, a flat, oh, I can't speak. Flat front light uh, is, is a good way to minimize your distortion. Now, obviously, the downside with this is while it's providing good visibility, it does tend to flatten the features. Everything looks a little bit flat and a little bit two dimensional. And one of our other objectives is revelation of form. We want people to look three dimensional. We want them to look good. So this is not a great angle from a sculpting point of view because it tends to make everybody look a little bit flat and a little bit like a cardboard cutout. Another problem, of course, is at high intensities, this light is going to cast really big, strong shadows in the background, shadows that would probably be really, really difficult to get rid of. Um, so if you are ever going to use these, we tend to use them at quite low intensities, just enough to sort of pick out any shadows that we need to, but not enough to cause shadows that we actually can't deal with in the background. And of course, a big problem with this is it can also be uncomfortable for performance. Having a light right into your eyes uh, is never very pleasant. So one of the solutions for this is we can actually take our light and we elevate it from that front position and we just elevate it up to a 45 degree angle. And what that does is it kind of mimics the light that we used to experience in natural. Most of our natural light, in fact, most of our artificial light as well, if you think of indoors and everything, it tends to come from above. The sun, uh, the down light is in your ceiling. We're used to seeing light come from above. So visually, it makes sense to our brain. It's an image that we're used to seeing. And that 45 degree angle uh, is perfect because what it does is it introduces a little bit of natural shadow uh, into the face while still maintaining that visibility. So we take our lights from a straight out from perfect and we lift them up to a 45 degree angle. And what this does is it provides excellent visibility, absolutely still see our actors' faces. But the big advantage is, is it's introducing some natural shadow into the face. So we're now starting to take care of the revelation of form objective at the same time. So we're getting visibility and revelation of form, two of our objectives in one fixture. So we're really sort of tightening up our process as we go. Another advantage is it reduces where the shadow falls behind the performer. If the light's coming from a 45 degree angle, the light sort of the shadow falls behind the performer onto the stage floor, which is perhaps as a painted texture, something like that. It makes it a little bit easier to hide the shadows. Some of the downsides to this angle, of course, is some of the features can still appear to be a little bit flat. So one of the ways we can compensate for that sort of flattening of the features is we actually take the light, we lift it up by 45 degrees, 
and we move it out to the side by a 45 degree. So we're sort of doing two things, up by 45 and out by 45. And what that does, as you can see here, is it casts a little bit of shadow off to the side and it starts to give you some really, really good sculpting properties. It maintains your visibility and it offers, introduces that natural shadow. And if you're going to run with the system, then what you need to do is you tend to add a second fixture coming in from the other side to fill the face from the other side. So you don't have somebody who only sort of appears to be three quarters lit. And what you tend to do if you're going to come in from two sides is you tend to have slightly different color tones in your fixtures. And we'll talk about why this is uh, next week in part three. Uh, some of the downsides uh, to this is of course it requires additional instruments. You need twice as many fixtures to be able to get your front of house cover. And this may be a limitation depending on the gear uh, that's available to you. Uh, and of course, for every light you add into the rig, it also adds another shadow. It's a shadow that's behind the performer normally on the floor, so not much of a problem. But where additional shadows start to become tricky to deal with is when you're trying to recreate a sort of realistic setting, if you're trying to light naturalistically and convince people that suspended disbelief uh, that we are you know, out in the park and it's the sunlight that's falling through. If you have multiple shadows, it creates a weird illusion because naturally we're only used to seeing one shadow on the floor. And all of a sudden, if behind your performer there are two shadows following them around, it kind of plays a little bit of havoc with the concept of suspended disbelief. And of course, it's not always possible to create this position consistently in a lot of theatres. Um, not all theatres have box boom positions, not all theatres have uh, proscenium boom positions, uh, and not all theatres front of house bridges are actually wide enough to give you that 45 degree shot. So it's not always possible, but it's certainly uh, something to use. So here you can see we've got two lights coming in, one from 45 degrees on each side, and we've put them in slightly different colours, ever so slightly, one in a warm and one in a cool. You can see the different colors slightly more clearly uh, in the shadows on our neck. But what it's doing by introducing the second fiction of different color is we're coloring the shadows. So we're saying, yes, it's lit, but it's lit slightly differently now. I sort of accept that as being uh, a reasonably natural light source on our performer. So we keep going up and we take from our 45 degree and we keep moving up and overhead and we end up with what we call a top light. So a top light is a light that comes from directly above, uh, directly above your performer. Uh, you may sometimes hear this referred to as a god light. Um, in the early 90s, there was a television series called Touched by an Angel. And the concept was a lady come down, an angel had come down to earth and she would do good deeds. And at the end of each episode, she would reveal herself as being the angel. And they would sort of bring this really bright sort of top light down on her for that sort of big reveal moment. Now, the advantage for me of top light is it's probably the most isolated or can be the most isolated and controlled light there is. If you think back to our earlier talk where we spoke about reflection, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So if the light is coming straight down, the light is just reflected straight back up. So you don't, and you can see that sort of just underneath the chin there, there's a little bit of sort of reflection starting to you know, illuminate. Uh, underneath the chin. So if I really need to isolate something on stage, my first instinct until I've had conversations with the directors and the rest of the team about what we actually want, my first instinct will be to add a top light. It has some really good sculpting properties. So it's not brilliant for visibility. We're losing quite a lot of detail on the face, uh, but sculpting wise, it's pretty good. We're getting some nice shape on our performer. Uh, which is what's important, trying to create that three-dimensional character on stage. So it's not really giving us a lot from a visibility point of view. What you are getting is you're getting some quite strong shadows under the eyes, and the eyes are really what we're focusing on when we're lighting faces. And of course, you get quite strong highlights uh, on the nose. So that's also something uh, to watch out for. If we take our fixture and we keep moving it behind our performer, we end up with what we call a backlight, a light coming in from behind the performer. And that's the result 
uh, of our backlight there. Now, I love backlighting. I can't, I can't think I've ever seen a show where there hasn't been some backlighting involved. And backlighting offers excellent sculpting properties because it creates this halo effect around the performer. And it's a really good way of separating them from their background. Uh, it's very easy if you have a sort of box set, for instance, and you just sort of throw a lot of front light in, it's quite easy for the performers to tend to blend into the background. Uh, and backlight is a good way that you can actually pull them apart and create that sense of separation. Backlight is also fantastic for setting mood. Uh, and it's a great way that we can actually introduce more saturated color into the show because it's not going to have an effect on skin tones. So if you want a really deep red or a really deep blue, or if you like me, you're quite partial to green, so a really nice green coming in from the backlight, uh, or coming into the show, getting it in as a backlight is probably a good shout, uh, because you're not going to have any effect on skin tone. In terms of setting the mood, where backlight is useful, again, if you think back to angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, your backlight bounces off the stage floor and bounces directly out towards the audience. So that is the dominant light source that they are seeing on the stage. They really, the audience really perceives a backlight. You might often have seen some pieces where the floor is sort of quite a strong blue and the performers are quite sort of naturally looking white. That's your backlight. That's the backlight that's bouncing out towards the audience. And it's a great way to set mood. If you want to change the mood of a piece, changing the color of your backlight is a great way to do it because that's the color and that's the shift that the audience is most aware of. Uh, obviously, from the downsides, not a lot of visibility on the face at all. So from a visibility, from a storytelling point of view, not great. Yes, there's visibility because our performer is lit within the space. Um, but in terms of uh, front light, of course, not much there. Something else, of course, with backlight is your shadows are going to end up in front of the performer. Now, nine times out of ten, this is probably not really a problem because your front light will probably fill out any of those shadows that are in there. But it's something to be aware of. Certainly, if you're working um, with LED fixtures that have multiple emitters, those shadows in front of the performers, those multicolored shadows, could be problematic for you. And sometimes your backlight does tend to spill out into the audience, depending on what your rigging positions are and how close the audience is to the stage. Um, that can sometimes be problematic as well. So from behind our fixture, we're now going to come around to the side. So we're going to sort of bring light in from the side, surprise, not surprisingly called the side light. And there you can see coming in directly from the side, lights half of the performer. And this is a fantastic angle for dance lighting. Um, anyone who spends any time in dance is quite heavily side of it because it has excellent sculpting properties. It does offer some visibility. There is a little bit of visibility there. If I were to add a fixture in from the other side, it would complete that picture. You may end up with a slight dark shadow down the front of the face, though, so that would be something uh, just to be careful of. It has excellent sculpting properties. It really pulls things into three dimensions, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a favoured angle uh, for dance lighting. And it is possible with side light. If you have a nice side light rigged on a boom at the side, you can actually cut that light up off the floor so you don't see any lights or any shadows on the floor. Your performers just tend to float uh, in the space. If you add a bit of backlight into that, strong backlight, that's the color the audience sees. A bit of side light cut off the floor so no shadows, uh, and you get these sort of bodies just magically floating in the space. Some of the downside, of course, the performers are going to cast shadows into one another. So you've had a line of dancers and you're coming in straight in from the side. By dancer number three, they've probably got hardly any light on them at all. Uh, so it is one thing to watch. Of course, the solution for that to take your side light is you elevate your side light so you can come in uh, over the side. And another problem with using side light is there may well be additional rigging uh, that's required that your theatre may not have. So it may be an additional uh, cost involved want to get some side lighting into your show. Uh, the last of these angles that I want to have a look at is something called uplight. And that's light that comes up from uh, underneath the actor. And I'm sure at some point we've all stood with a flashlight under our chin and we've sort of leapt out from behind the door and sort of terrified our little baby brother or sister. And one of the reasons it's scary is because it's unnatural. 
we're not used to seeing light come from below. We're used to seeing light come from above. So as soon as we're lit from underneath, our brain all of a sudden says, something's not right here. Something so it doesn't look right. And that's why it's often tend uh, to use it mainly for effects, uh, certainly for the evil characters appearing on stage. Um, of course, it does offer some visibility. Um, you are getting some shadows uh, around the eyes. But one of the nice things for me about our flag is it actually helps our information objective. So let's say, for instance, we wanted to suspend disbelief and convince the audience that we were sitting around a campfire. Lighting them from above is not going to work. Lighting from below convinces the audience that we're sitting around a fire because the light source is sort of coming from that direction. So while it may look unnatural in some instances, uh, it does absolutely have its uses. Uh, it used to be quite common, although less so, uh, for there to be footlights on the front of the stage, just be sort of batons of footlights running along the front of the stage. And they were also really useful if you were helping to light realistically. If you wanted to convince the audience that you were standing outside in a nice grassy field, you would have your front light for your sunlight coming in from the top. And what I would do is I would add a little bit of green up light just to catch the sort of underneath of the chin. Because if you stand outside and you have a look at somebody standing in a green field, the light reflecting off the grass actually casts a sort of green up light. So it's that little bit of extra information that you can say to the audience, hey, we're standing in a grassy field. Of course, the downsides to this is it can be unnatural and unflattering. And probably one of the biggest problems that needs managing is the shadows that it casts in the background. If you were to go back to our campfire example, uh, if you were lighting a campfire situation, of course, the shadows in the background becomes part of the story, it becomes part of what you use to sell that illusion, especially when you have multiple fixtures. So you're creating multiple fixtures to overlay shadows and give you a sense of movement uh, to help support the fact that it's sort of flame light flickering. So those are our six basic angles. But of course, there are always variations on that. So if we have a side light, we can elevate the side light to a 45 degree. It now becomes a 45 degree side light, uh, which we tend to refer to as a pipe end because it tends to live at the end of the electrics bar. Um, so here, for instance, is an example of a light coming in from the side, but at 45 degrees to the back. Also hugely popular in dance lighting, great sculpting qualities. Uh, and in this next little image, we have that same 45 degree side light with just a little bit of front 45 coming in, just for a little bit of fill uh, to help pick out the faces. So next up, I've got a short little video clip that I'm going to play. And basically what they've done is they've taken an actress and they've just lit her continually in some different light sources. And you can really see how the shape of the face changes. I think that's one of my uh, one of my favorite examples. Is you can actually, when you see it all sort of strung together like that, I could almost see uh, the Scottish play being lit, the witches gathered around the cauldron, uh, and having some sort of light source moving around, just creating these sort of permanently changing shadows. I think it actually be something quite magical. Uh, so here we have a look at sort of angles on on faces and, and on our actors. Let's have a couple of look at examples of how that light changes our perception of what's actually going on on the stage. So here we've got a bit of front light coming in. There's also a little bit of some light coming in from the back just to sort of fill the space. And you can see it's really quite flat. Um, there's not a lot of depth. There's not a lot of dimension. And of course, you've got that really big shadow uh, hanging about there in the background. And if we lower that fixture down into an up light, while it becomes a more interesting space straight away, so a simple change of angle on the whole space sort of changes its feel, uh, you do get that really strong shadow sitting in the background. Uh, which could be a really, really tricky thing uh, to try and get rid of. Uh, so here, if we have a look, we've got lights that are coming in as our sort of high side. This would be our sort of pipe end uh, angle. And again, it's introducing some natural shadow. It's creating a focal point. 
It's giving our eyes a sense of direction and travel. Uh, if we change that over here, we've got a combination of things. We've got the top light coming in, um, a little bit of front light just picking up our performer a little bit. And that's that would be your sort of 45 degree front because you can see the shadow falling uh, just behind the performer. And then we start getting into the sort of slightly more uh, dramatic angles. And here's a sort of strong backlight coming in. Uh, and you can see then it changes the whole way that we perceive the space. And adding that in, um, they've added in just a little bit of extra filter, a bit of extra side light just to pick him out a bit more, just to tell that story a little bit more. And here is just really kind of just sort of floodlit. This would be your sort of stage workers. Uh, and you can see how it kind of because all of a sudden there's sort of wrinkles in the set that you're not noticing and, and all that sort of thing. And I think the reason I pop this picture in there is because it's one of my favorite moments in theatre. Always has been. There are two things that I love without fail. One is a gauze dissolve. A good gauze dissolve is fantastic. And the other thing that I love is that moment where you put your preset on and it doesn't look great. And then they switch off the stage workers. And in that breath, the whole space just comes to life and just gives itself over to the magic. And that's one of my favorite moments. Uh, here we go. So it's coming in a bit more as a top light. Um, and again, they've got a little bit of front light. You can see the shadow of the performer there on, on the back wall. And then we get into the really more dramatic things where we just have this really strong key light coming in from the side. So it really just punches through. And narratively, this tells us a whole lot. I mean, straight away, the information objective is visibility taken care of revelation of form, this one source, well, there's probably a second source with a bit of light through that door at the back, but that bright source coming through just tells us so much about what's going on. Uh, and then there's another variation on that, so a really strong key through the door. And what they're relying on here is the reflection of the set to actually just cast a little bit of light uh, onto the performer. They've probably cheated a little bit and added a little bit of low side light, you can tell from the high shadow on the side uh, popping in there. Uh, and again, just some structures and some objects to have a look at. I always find this is a great thing to play around with. If you want to test angles and test shadows, just get some shapes and get some textures and just grab a torch, grab your cell phone, um, and just play around with the light, move it around, see how it changes. So we've got some direct up light. Here you can see that flat front lighting. Yes, it's illuminated, but the shapes, there's nothing visually exciting there at all. But as soon as we introduce a little bit of shadow, uh, so this is our sort of direct side coming in, a little bit of shadow, and all of a sudden the whole thing pulls into three dimensions. A uh, little bit of backlighting. So now this is actually a backlighting where they've actually lit what would be a backcloth or a cytorama, and we're just sort of seeing a little bit of soft diffuse light spilling through the objects. Uh, and then here's a sort of 45 degree from behind, sort of favoured dance angle coming in through, and again, creates a bit of visual interest. It creates very strong silhouettes of the shapes. And this is more of a traditional backlight, so light coming in directly from behind, so not bouncing off a cloth. Coming in, picking up those silhouettes again. Uh, a little bit of sort of diffused up lighting, just softens those shadows a little bit. A combination of some top and some down lighting. Again, not visually interesting, they've sort of flattened this out a little bit. Uh, and there we go, here's a combination, it's a little bit of side lighting. This is coming in from a 45 degree angle from above, creates the shadows, creates the interest, gives you some visibility. Uh, so it kind of ticks uh, a whole bunch of boxes right there. Uh, so let's pause there for a sec. Rory, have you got any questions that have come in? Yes, we've had a couple of questions to come in. Um, Matilda asked earlier on, um, what is a good angle for backlight? Uh, Hi, Matilda, thanks for that. Um, sorry, I probably should have mentioned that. Typically, your backlight would be at a 45 degree angle as well, uh, as much as possible. That obviously becomes a really difficult thing to maintain the further you get upstage uh, and not always possible with scenery and borders and all that kind of thing. But that's kind of the theory behind it is you do 45 from the front and 45 from behind. Um, but any, in any backlight angle, so long as it's not sort of directly from above, anything that sort of pulls back from something directly from above is a perfectly acceptable backlight angle. Um, if you're worried about uh, spilling into the audience, um, then obviously you can sort of steepen up your backlight angle a little bit, um, which will probably help deal, deal with some of those issues. 
Um, Alan then goes on to ask for uh, what sort of rigging positions would you be putting flat front from? Is that the balcony rail? Any other places? Yes, sorry, I should have mentioned it. it could be the balcony rail. Uh, it's most likely to be the balcony rail, sort of circle front. Um, it can sometimes also be if your control room uh, sits sort of between the two tiers, sometimes your control room is at that level. We've often rigged stuff in the control room just sort of shining out of the audience's heads. That normally tends to be more of a projection thing than a sort of flat front light thing. Um, mostly, uh, we would tend to use sort of circle, circle rail or balcony rail for that. Um, and Peggy would like you to kind of talk a little bit more about the, the difference between using pipe ends versus a strict 40 feet, 45 degree angle to, to focus things. Um, she gets confused because the pipe ends become steep, um, but maybe she's misunderstanding the placement of them. That's her words, not mine. That's fine. Um, so I, I guess it, it, it's it will, in session four, we'll have a look at how we sort of break down all these systems in a little bit more detail and look, sort of look at their, at their positions. Um, but effectively, what we're trying to do with our sort of what I call a pipe end position tends to sort of live as far out on the end of the bar as it will get. And it, it sort of comes in ideally what happens is your first one, to, in order to lie almost beneath it, it does, be, it does become quite a steep angle. Um, and then you sort of have a next one along that sort of flattens out and flattens out and flattens out as you go. Um, so they, they do, they can be quite steep. Um, sometimes if you wanted to achieve a real 45 degree angle, there'd probably actually be a ladder hanging somewhere off in the winds um, to give you that elevated position because a pipe end would probably be closer to about 60 or 70 degrees certainly for your first fixture. Um, what we tend to do is we tend to use everything in, in combinations. It's not often that anything is ever really used in isolation. So your pipe end would probably be filling in something that's coming directly from the side. So you would have your main side light coming in and your pipe end would just be filling a little bit of that shadow that's caused uh, from people interfering uh, with each other in terms of their positions. Um, I, I hope that, that answers the question. Uh, I think that's everything that we've we've had so far. And Peggy says that was a wonderful answer. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, so here are just some links again. I do have one other thing I want to show you um, before the end of the session. Um, so uh, if anybody would like to have a look at these links, Rory, I think you've got these links that you can pop in pop in the Q and A panel somewhere. Is that all right? They are appearing in the chat because then you can all definitely okay. see them. Um, and the reason I say that is because I'm about to unshare my screen to share a different screen to show you something. Um, I. I teased in the last session that uh, there'd be something cool coming. And I just want to give you another little taster of that quickly. So bear with me while I swap screens. So while Declan uh, clicks buttons, um, I'll just cover, uh, cover some of what those links are. Um, so this series of talks is based on a set of six posters that have been designed um, specifically with educators in mind, uh, but are great for, for anyone who's beginning in lighting. Um, they're available to download from uh, from the link in that chat window. Um, we are also working on a, a booklet um, which will be ready shortly. It's going through its final stage of editing, um, so you can kind of register your interest there. Um, equally, we're running dozens and dozens of these uh, sort of sessions. Um, they are advertised via our study hall page, um, etc.com slash study hall. Uh, where we have all sorts of things aimed at all sorts of people um, so keep your eye on that and then all of those talks get uploaded to our youtube channel um, and finally uh, if you are interested in learning our consoles uh, or some of our other more formal courses um, our learning stage is free until the 16th of may um, we will probably go back to uh, to charging for courses from the 17th of may um, but you can buy them at zero dollars uh, and they will remain in your account forever. Um, so just get in there and, and buy them before the 16th of May. Back to you. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, so what you're looking at here is, um, we, I don't know if you remember, but if some of you may remember, but quite some years ago, probably 10 or 15 years ago, there used to be an online software package called the Virtual Light Lab. And what that did is it let you put fixtures in the room and you could just play with some basic color and play with some basic intensity and sort of see what it was doing on stage. You could create some basic stage looks. Well, that software doesn't work anymore on any of the existing machines out there now. So what we've been able to do is we've actually recreated that using our augmented software. So uh, augmented is part of EOS family 3.0. 
uh, which is currently in open beta testing. So I'm going to show you how this all, how it's all sort of put together. And this uh, file that I'm working with now will be available for sessions three and four as part of the download package. So when you sign up uh, for part three and part four next week, uh, this file will also be there as something you can download. We're just doing the final tweaks on it at the moment, but I did want to show you uh, how it works. So what it is, is within Augmented, you can pick a fixture. So I can pick uh, fixture number one, and you can pick a position by clicking anywhere on stage. I can then turn that light on, and by clicking and holding, I can now focus that light onto the performer. I can take my second light, and I can say, pop it onto the boom. I can turn that onto full, and it sort of is already focused on the performer, which is a bit of luck. And I can make that, yeah, let's make a color a little bit stronger than that. There we go. Uh, okay, there we go. Get it in the so you can start to sort of build up. Uh, these cues, you've got up to 10 lights that you can put in. Uh, you can select any fixture and you can change it to beam angle. You can be a 19 degree, a 26, a 36, and I pop back down to a 19. And I'm just going to take the color out of there for a second. If you want to add a gobo in there, you can add a gobo into that, which you can pull into sharp focus. You can have a medium focus or a soft focus. So it's a really great tool that you can use to sort of start playing around, having a look at the different lighting angles, see what's possible, uh, play with color, play with intensity. Uh, there are a couple other shapes that you can pop in as well. Uh, next week when it's ready and we've uploaded the full package for you to download, I will walk you through everything in a bit more detail. But I just wanted to give you the heads up uh, that this tool was coming uh, and it will be available for download uh, next week for the session. Just a couple of things. Um, it relies on you having the latest version of uh, the version 3.0 software. So if you haven't already signed up on the forums, uh, you can join the Open Beta Forum. Uh, so via, via your MyETC account, you can sign in, join the forums, look for Open Forum, Open Beta, choose the EOS, and you'll be able to download the latest version of 3.0, uh, which will allow this uh, program to run. Uh, so that's all from me for today. Uh, if there's any other questions, we're going to be in the room for a little bit more. So feel free to uh, ask some questions. Uh, but I did want to say thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week for part three and part four. Part three, we do a bit of a deep dive into color because uh, it's one of the most fascinating things to me about lighting. It's a part of design that I love the most. Uh, and part four, we sort of throw everything that we've covered in parts one, two, and three together, and uh, we sort of build up, build up a design. We look at the sort of design process to actually create, uh, create your first design. Uh, so hopefully you'll join us for that. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been great having you here. And uh, if there's any other questions, uh, feel free. We'll be here for a few more minutes. Thank you very much. Great. I'm happy to take some questions, Rory, if you've. Uh, come in. What day is part three on? That's an easy one. Yeah, that's on Tuesday next week. Uh, same time, uh, 3, so 3.30 UK time, which is 9.30, uh, is it called Central 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 Daylight Time? I never get it right. Central Daylight uh, Time. Central Daylight Time, 9.30. Um, and yeah, Tuesday next week. And then on Friday next week uh, is session number four at the same time. Um, we're having a couple of questions specifically aimed um, uh, about running augmented um, or specific things about how to, to do things in Augmented. This is very much not uh, the, the two people to be asking about this. Um, I would recommend that you follow that link through to the, the beta forum and you'll get better support there than, than Declan or I trying to, to kind of talk you through those little details. Um, yeah, there's some great information out there for Augmented, especially on the beta site. There is a, a sort of general, there are sort of three forums within the beta site and one of them is sort of general help and tips and um, most of the questions that I think you need will there'll be an answer in there. Um, Mark would like to know uh, how you would rank the six positions from most important to least. Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, I, think I think the easy answer Mark is depends on the scene. Yeah. <laughs> it, it depends on, on what it is you're lighting. So for instance if I'm lighting a play and I'm just sort of really simply telling the story. There's no sort of important moments that need 
you know, punctuating or anything like that, I would say that um, I would tend to start with my front light uh, and then I add in a little bit of backlight and then I sort of fluff it out with a little bit of side, a little bit of texture, et cetera, et cetera. If on the other hand, I am lighting a dance piece, then side light, excuse me, side light becomes my default uh, go-to and I'll always start there. And then add a little bit of backlight or a little bit of sort of 45 degree or something like that to sort of shape the stage. Um, so I guess it, it's probably not a helpful answer, but it, it does depend entirely on uh, on what it is you're doing at that particular moment. Um, the sort of rule of thumb for me is whichever one you're starting with, just make sure you're getting as many of your objectives covered uh, as possible uh, in, in the order that, that is important for that particular moment. Uh, I don't think the links are up yet, um, Emma. The the next week sessions will appear in, in study hall probably on Monday, I think, is when we post the week sessions. Um, they will be on Tuesday and Friday next week, um, not Thursday as it is today. And yeah, those links will, will appear there and will probably likely appear on all the social media channels like it did this year, the, this week. Uh, Declan mentioned books in the first session. They're very expensive in the US. Uh, are they really best available in the UK? Um, I think, Scott, they're really expensive in the UK as well. Um, I, it is the downside of, of us being a very, very niche industry. Um, I will see if I can look into um, some, some other sources for you. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head if there's some decent web resources. I'm sure I've seen some. Um, I will find up. some web resources and make sure that they are in the slides for, uh, for session three. Uh, Ashley says, I've had producers step in to tell directors it's too bright on stage. Directors always seem to want it too bright. How do you handle these directors so the producers don't have to? I love a producer who gives me a note that something's too bright. Um, because I, I do, I think we chatted about it briefly last time, but it, it does tend to feel that we, we overlight stuff. Do you know what I find the problem is with uh, when that happens is if someone's complaining that it's too bright, it's probably not too bright as much as they're not sure where they should be looking. So it's more of a focus issue. Uh, so I find often, um, you know, just picking out the person who's important and losing uh, a little bit of the light around the site. So you don't necessarily have to drop the intensity of the location of the scenes. So if they're sort of playing downstage center, you don't need to make downstage center necessarily uh, any dimmer, but you can certainly lose some of the sort of peripheral lighting. Um, in, in in terms of in terms of directors, uh, it's it's always a tricky one because of course they have an overarching vision, um, and, and we as as designers have have an overarching vision. Hopefully, those two uh, tend tend to mesh quite nicely. Um, and again, I think you know it, it, if your director is wanting it bright and wanting it bright and wanting it brighter, have a conversation about what it is that's actually bothering them. If they if they genuinely can't see eyes then that's perhaps something that needs to be addressed. If they say, I'm not quite sure what's going on, that's probably a clue that there is too much peripheral light around the sides. And it's, it's time to start sort of taking things out and sort of shaping, shaping the scene uh, a little bit more. Um, Bruce, I'm at, uh, I work in dance performance where angles and good practice are sometimes thrown out. What are your thoughts on non-visibility, full or partial of bodies where shadows also become part of the performance? For me, that's one of the most exciting things about lighting and dance is you can get away with a minute and a half solo with just a single backlight on somebody or just a single side light. Um, that for me is, is, is one of the sort of things that I, that I enjoy about dance. I find it unbelievably creative. Um, sometimes it, the contrast can be a little bit too much and you can sort of struggle with that a little bit in which case it's worth trying to add a little bit of light in, uh, but try and add color into the shadows. So for instance, if you had, you know, sort of bright white light coming down from on top, maybe a little bit of pale blue or something coming in from the sides at a low intensity. So it's still, so you're still reading the effect of that strong source. So we're not breaking down the integrity of the look but we're just softening that a little bit and just making sure there's a bit more detail in the faces and a little bit more revealed uh, in, in some of the movements. Uh, but I, I do find it quite exciting, the ability to uh, be able to really push those boundaries in, in 
and go down and have somebody just in a single source. I'm not sure I'd like to see that for an entire work, uh, but certainly for moments within the work, it's quite exciting to be able to really just drop down to a to a single floating figure on stage. Well, I think that is all of the questions that are currently sitting in uh, right. Thank you very much. Q and A window. Um, we will stick around for a couple of minutes if anyone has has anything else. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank Enjoy you your weekends when you get there. And we we'll hope to see you all next week. And we hope that you've all spent the weekend playing with your cell phones in dark rooms, lighting your housemates. Thank you. Goodbye.